Is this thing on? Welcome back to Big Mouth and fancy seeing you here in June. A very welcome, my friends, and especially my enemies. Come in, sit down, no touching. I don't do the touching. Welcome back to welcome back to Big Mouth. Let me get my words out in a straight line. And welcome back to Big Mouth. And you can keep this conversation going over on my Twitter at movies TV Mad. So we live in interesting times, boys and girls. Do you remember the old days when you could just go and watch a movie and there wasn't so much analysis and talk and political agenda? Wasn't that fun? I saw Field of Dreams once, twice, three, four times, enjoyed it. I thought about it by myself and there was no one to confer with back then. Um, no one had my passion for films. I was very, very young, watched it and enjoyed it. The same with so many other movies. The problem with social media right now is there's too much talk, there's too much analysis, and there's far too much p political agenda connected to film. And it's ever since Donald Trump became president, of course, and everyone's gone insane on both sides, middle of the argument, that argument, that argument, and it's become very problematic. So this year has been a horrific year for Hollywood, but a very successful year for the fandom menace. Um, who are the fandom menace? We've discussed them many times. They're a group of people who don't like what Hollywood are doing. They don't like the identity politics um, forced into um, films these days. And uh, there's a lot of hatred towards men from Hollywood. And there's so many things going on. And this year, and I mean, this year's nearly through, and that's why I'm doing this video. I think we need to discuss what's happened this year thus far. So Hollywood versus the fandom menace is interesting because the fandom menace are separate groups of people, individuals who have YouTube channels, who have a big following. Well, some of them have a big following, some of them not so much. Uh, you, you're talking about world-class bullshitters. You're talking about Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers. You're talking about that Star Wars girl. Um, she seems to have gone quiet these days, actually. But these are ordinary people who are vocally very clever and intelligent and know how to attack Hollywood and how to hurt Hollywood. And it's become a very, very big war. And from what I can see, the fandom menace are winning. So the big, the kind of big free for all at the beginning of the year really was Captain Marvel. Now, Captain Marvel really wasn't the target of the fandom menace. It was really what its star, Brie Larson, was saying about toxic masculinity, that fictional term they're all using now. So when she, she did a press conference one day and she, she started saying that, you know, there's not, there's not enough female critics, there's not enough female critics of colour or people of colour reviewing films. Last time I checked, no one's stopping any of those people becoming critics. But anyway... Then she made a very big statement that nobody, you know, um, a wrinkle in time isn't for white men in their 40s. And of course, this is true. Now, Ava DuVernay made this film. It's a very bland, uninteresting film. You may watch in, an after, on the, after, in the afternoon, maybe on the Disney, Disney Plus streaming service when it comes out. It isn't a blockbuster movie. It didn't make a lot of money. And it has a lot of identity politics, but this film doesn't go at any group, doesn't attack a group. It really is a harmless film with representation. It just isn't a particularly interesting film. It's neither a bad film nor a good film. So anyway, she became very hard, very extreme left, and she was making a lot of massive statements, which made her the target of the fandom menace. Now, again, I'll be clear, the fandom menace's target wasn't the female-led Captain Marvel. That wasn't what was going on here. But that film became a target in the end because of her, because of Disney and her agenda. Maybe Disney told her to say what she was saying. It was controversy. Because what she was saying was very sexist and very, and very racist. Now, what's interesting to me, what the fandom menace did here, they went for her in a big way. I mean, that's why Jeremy finishes each video with thank you very much, which she said famously one day. But I think the thing is here, what they did very smartly as well, they took James Cameron's Alita movie and tried to use it against Captain Marvel. Now, this is how smart they are. I don't believe Alita would have 
I mean, it didn't do great at the box office, but it would have done far worse if the fandom menace didn't decide to use it as a shield against Captain Marvel. Now, ultimately, Captain Marvel was sandwiched just before Avengers Endgame, which was the sequel not only to Avengers Infinity War, but literally the conclusion of Phase 1 to 3 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So that film was going to do well, whatever happened. People were intrigued if there was going to be any Easter eggs for Endgame. Really, there was a post credit scene, and that was it. But people were always going to go and see that film. That film made a billion dollars. So a lot of you kind of normies out there say, well, the fandom menace lost that argument, Mick. But I don't think so. I don't agree with that. I think a point was proven because when you actually look at who went to see Captain Marvel, more men in their 40s than women of any age went to see that film. Now, it's true, of course, that women didn't go and see Alita. Men, predominantly men, went to see Alita. Maybe more women than men went to see Alita than Captain Marvel, but Captain Marvel's big L was, big lose, was the fact that this was supposed to be a film to inspire young girls, girls to get more females to go to the cinema, and it didn't do that. All it was was the normal geek male audience in their 40s from 30 to 40. So really, it didn't do what they claimed it was going to do. Now, of course, publicly, they were doing a lot of marketing. Brie was taking a lot of photos with girls dressed up as Captain Marvel. It just didn't work. Now, if we go back to 2017, it's interesting to see um, what happened with Wonder Woman. Now, Wonder Woman's marketing was very, very interesting because they weren't very triggering. They didn't go for men. Of course, Gal and Patty spoke about wanting to inspire young women, but they made it clear, and Patty made it clear, and I've, I've quoted this so many times because it's important, and it sums up who Warner Brothers are compared to Disney. Disney are a big company, but with a small company's mentality. That's the problem because they're still not really used to being the biggest entity, the biggest studio in the world. Uh, that that what, what, what they've done, what Iger has achieved with them is a global phenomenon. No one can touch what they do and what they achieve and the profits that they make. But their mentality is so small time compared to Warner Brothers. So Patsy said, and I quote, Wonder Woman is for everyone. This was key at the time. Wonder Woman was really Warner Brothers' hope to keep the DCEU going. And it actually worked. It really, you know, it made over $800 million globally. It was a big success. And the movie was very good. One of the best CBMs I've seen. And it achieved so much. And when you look at that film, when you look at Captain Marvel and how they, she nicks the bike of the guy who tells her to smile, sweetheart. But then you've got Wonder Woman sitting down with a group of men by a fireplace, talking to them, inspiring them. Being a real hero, there's a difference of mentality there. You have got a str strong female lead who isn't sexualized at all. What James Cameron said was nonsense. I might do a vid uh, another video about that later. But she's inspirational to men and women. And she always has been in the comics as well, by the way, and in the TV show. So there's a big difference. Meanwhile, over at Disney, they wanted to make some big, you know, ultra, you know, extreme left statements. And all that did, well, nothing. It didn't do anything. Basically, whoever was going to turn up for any other Marvel film turned up for Captain Marvel, and that was the fandom menace's um, victory. No, they didn't stop people from going, but at the end of the day, that wasn't what they were trying to do. Ultimately, they were trying to shine a light on what Brie Larson was saying. And in the end, with all the videos, takedown videos off her, they did. I saw quite a few the Star Wars girl did. And to be honest with you, they made her look dumb, they made her look stupid because what the fandom men is do is they talk logic over insanity. And this is what's happened um, with Hollywood. So at the end of the day, that film made plenty of money. But and this is proof that they won. Captain Marvel was scenes were reduced in end game. That's a fact. They won't admit it. They won't say it. But because of what the fandom men did, Disney got scared. And because there was so much 
you know, kind of toxicity towards Captain Marvel. And really, Captain Marvel is an okay film. It's neither great, it's neither um, rubbish, but it's a good film. It's an okay film. I think even Geeks and Gamers independent critic gave it a good write-up. It's an okay film, and I enjoyed it, especially Jude Law's performance, but Brie Larson does a good job as well. Everyone does in that film. The target was never the film, but you could see that the fandom men is scared them and, and intimidated, them, intimidated them so much that they actually removed Brie Larson from, you know, big chunks of that film. So you see her at the beginning and you see her at the end fight, and then she's too busy. Uh, and, and that statement was made again in Spider-Man Far From Home, a really, really poor um, hero, um, a superhero film, by the way. Very boring, very filler. But again, the excuse is she's on another planet. Um, so again, um, they are doing a Captain Marvel 2. Hopefully they don't make the same mistakes in their marketing as they did this time. But I would call that a victory um, for the fandom menace. And really, we went on. This was a year that Star Wars wasn't going to be released. The next Star Wars film, The Rise of Skywalker, wasn't going to be released until December. So the fandom menace um, weren't going to get their teeth stuck into that for, for, for a very, very long time. For me, there's two victories this year with films. Um, not talking about the fandom menace, but you've got the Joker movie and you've got Shazam. Shazam really is, a, is an interesting film because... Um, again, the fandom men has tried to put that film against Captain Marvel. Now, Warner Brothers tried to put a stop to it by saying, don't do it. You know, we're not, we love um, Marvel, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, again, the fandom men has helped that film make a hell of a lot more money than maybe it would have done. Um, it's, it's the lowest box office for a DCEU movie, but it was a very good film. It did well. And, and the money they spent on the film was so low it didn't really matter anyway. So two really good blockbuster films this year are Joker and Shazam for very, very different reasons. And, and so we kind of went through this year with quite a few controversies. Um, I think the Batwoman one was an interesting one, but I think the people behind Batwoman thought if they could create the controversies that Brie Larson and Captain Marvel did, and Captain Marvel isn't actually a controversial film, so they tried to get um, its its lead star to be controversial, but again, it didn't work. It, the film, the the TV show is a flop, but the the fandom men has made a hell of a lot of videos on that, and I'm sure it, that helped make it the flop. It's not a good series. At the end of the day, it is not a good series. The problem with that is because Kate Kane is supposed to be an LBGT character, but it, its lead is, um, well, the LBGT community don't like her, don't like her, uh, don't like what she represents. So there's been a bigger problem. And in, in fact, I'd say really the failure of that is more to do with the LBGT community not supporting Batwoman than uh, the fandom menace going against it. And it's been, again, a very interesting year when the fandom menace have gone against Star Trek. Um, Star Trek really, um, since... Um, the new series has been been out there, and the fandom menace has got, have gone for that again. They have revealed a lot of stuff on it, and that that show has had to change showrunner after showrunner. It's been really difficult. More um, victories for the fandom menace, and they are called the fandom menace for a reason. They are a menace to Hollywood. It, the success of them is amazing, and it seems to me, um, I mean, Hollywood have tried to force YouTube to take down their videos. Well, I mean, we saw what happened with Rotten Tomatoes because of what was going on with Captain Marvel. Um, they, they, they stopped people from, from, you know, from voting for that film and that, any other film until actually the, the film's been released. So lots of rule changes to try and protect Hollywood against the fandom menace, and it hasn't really worked. So lots of interesting things going on here, as I say. We live in interesting times. And then there was the revelation that Phoebe Waller-Bridge would be rewriting James Bond, even though the official talk was she was just putting some gags in. Wouldn't surprise me if Phoebe actually cameos in that film as well. Trailer coming very soon. So that's exciting. So what they decided to do is say that, because in the last film, uh, James, James Bond gave, gave, oh, that bloody phone. Ignore it. But... 
I think that's the that's the thing. So what was revealed was that 007 would be a, a woman of colour because Bond, aka Daniel Craig, has given up his 00 status. He doesn't want to be a secret agent anymore. Again, more controversy, more identity politics. And what scares me is that Bond will be killed off at the end of the movie and we will have a, a woman of colour taking the lead in this franchise. Now, what? listen, I don't care if, a, if we have a woman of colour leading a movie, being an action hero. But you can't kill off James Bond and replace her, you know, replace him with her. That, my friends, is identity politics at its worst. And it's infesting Hollywood and it's so bad. So now we come to Star Wars and it's really hitting the fans. But before we, we go to Star Wars, and I forgot all about this, the biggest controversy of the year has to be Game of Thrones. Um, David, David Bainoff and D.B. Wise, I think that's their names, isn't it? The showrunners of Game of Thrones could do no wrong. They were like the second coming in the early seasons of Game of Thrones. What happened in season eight shocked me, stunned me and astounded me. I saw the fandom menace go at them and go at that show like I've never seen it before. They went for this. And the problem with Game of Thrones, I suppose there was some identity um, politics there with certain, certain things that happened within that final season. Ultimately, it was very, very disappointing how they ended it. When you see a show in its first four or five years, so good. But I think... What I learned from the fandom menace in their videos is that Dan and Dave were good at adapting stories, but once that they ran out of books, um, I, I think they, that, that became a big problem. Now, I think I think George R. R. Martin is also to blame for this. He's, he's a lazy fucker. He should have finished all the books so they could have adapted them. It's obvious to me that's why he brought them on. They were good adapters of a story and they did a good job. Now, whether they're good showrunners or anything like that, I don't know. But ultimately, if they had something to adapt, there wouldn't have been any problems. It's really difficult to finish something off like Game of Thrones from your own mind. And what they did was terrible. Um, Cersei's role in the final season was non-existent. You wanted a big bitch battle, didn't you? Didn't you? You know, f between Daenerys and Cersei. That would have been awesome. The whole, look, the whole thing didn't work. Um, obviously, they spent a lot of money on it. It looked fantastic. The cast, the crew, everyone worked, who worked on it yet again did a fantastic job. But it let the fans down. And I think the kind of tact that Warner Brothers had and the people working on it said, you're insulting the people who worked on it by, by saying these things. We wasn't. We love the people who work on Game of Thrones. We respect the people who work on Game of Thrones. At the end of the day, that's no way to end an epic franchise. It was lazy because they weren't. They even cut the episode order. It was lazy just so they could get onto their Star Wars project. And then what happened very, very quickly because of what happened and what the fandom menace did again, ultimately Disney sucked Dan and Dave from Star Wars and they had to go and get another job at Netflix. And who knows what kind of mess they're going to create over there as well. So the fandom menace have had many, many victories this year. Of course, we had Joker in the month of October. Again, SJWs and the critics went for Joker, big time, because it was about an incel. It was about a white male lead. They were trying to make us feel sorry for a, a white male who just kills people indiscriminately. But that's not the true um, synopsis of the film. Arthur, Arthur Fleck is a man who's suffering with mental health. He's living in poverty and he can't have his meds any longer. He can't have a psychiatrist any longer. So we feel sorry for the man, but when he becomes the Joker, we're very compelled and disturbed by it, which is the point. But they try to take this film down, and again, again, SJW Hollywood failed, failed, because Warner Brothers allowed this man, Todd Phillips, to do what he wanted. $900 million later, the people have said, F you. Again, the fandom menace win, Access Media and Access Hollywood lose. They have big problems. How long they're going to try and do this identity politics and attack so-called toxic masculinity, I don't know. 
it's certainly not working for them. Then we have Terminator Dark Fate. Now, this is the biggest loss that SJW Hollywood have had. Access Media came out giving this film a gr great reviews. Terminator Dark Fate is the best film since Terminator 2. They were spinning you. They were manipulating you. In other words, it's better than all the crap films. Amazing, amazing. Already we knew that they didn't really like it, but they were spinning their words. They were told to say what they were saying by the studios. And because they're called Access Media, they want to continue having access to the stars and the studios. So sometimes they have to, they have to bend the knee using a Game of Thrones term. And they did. But as soon as people started watching it, they realised it's not a bad movie, it's not a good movie. But what they did to John Connor, and again, you know, this is this is SJW Hollywood at its worst, right? At its worst, where you see them destroy, dissolve a character like like John Connor, aka Edward Furlong. They de-aged him beautifully. They killed him so they could put a female in his place as the hero. And no one's buying it. No one's going to watch it. Again, the fandom menace did their job. The fandom menace have become a menace. And they do a great job in keeping Hollywood honest. They're not keeping Hollywood honest. It's the most corrupt, corrupt kind of business and institution. You're fine. And it's been corrupt for 40, 50, 60 years, way before the fandom menace was created. But the internet has created the fandom menace. They have the tools now to say what they want to say, to sit Hollywood back down and find out hidden information that you and me just don't know. What's going to happen next year? It's another big year. We have four Love and Thunder in development. That's going to be interesting. They've already, the fandom menace are already going for that. And it goes on and it goes on. The truth of the matter is, there's many things that I don't agree with the fandom menace about, but they are a necessary evil because it, there is a culture war out there and it is in your films. And I remember watching Disney films as a kid and loving them. And now they're trying to stick identity politics in them as well. I'm looking forward to Frozen 2, but you just know they're going to do something and the fandom menace will be ready and they should be. Hollywood and the rest of the entertainment industry, I haven't even spoken about Doctor Who because we haven't, you know, we haven't had a show, uh, but we did have a show earlier this year, didn't we? Um, so was it this year or last year? I can't remember. But anyway, the stink over Doctor Who as well. And the fandom menace was there again. You know, a big shout out uh, to um, Neurotic Channel. He's doing such a fabulous job, um, you know, taking shooting down. Um, SJW Hollywood. He really is one of the best and he does it in such a great way. Great channel. Definitely follow him. But the battle will go on because we just want films that we can enjoy. Especially us men. We don't want it. We don't want to. We don't want to be accused of being toxic males, that we're bad people. I don't think we are. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's good. And nobody's bad. But SJWs put themselves up as the perfect human beings. They put identity politics commentary in their films. But as soon as someone like Todd Phillips talks about the most important problems in the world, they try and destroy him. They try and destroy his film. And they didn't. Oh, yes, my friends, the world is changing. The Hollywood Reporter and Access Media at the end of this year will boast about how many billions Disney have made. But a bunch of billions made by one company doesn't make a successful industry, a successful Hollywood. Disney are not putting their money back into Hollywood. They're taking it out and filling their coffers. They might, their films and content may, may make money, but they're not making classic films. You're going to remember. Disney used to make brilliant animated movies. Animated movies I'll never forget and you'll never forget. But now they're in the business of politics. For crying out loud, Bob Iger wants to run for president. This is what they've become now. They've become toxic. They say we're toxic, but they've become toxic. That's the problem. That's the issue. This year is a victory for the fandom menace. And I would say any member of the fandom menace who is on Twitter and YouTube 
You are doing a fabulous job. And I'd say, keep up the good work. See you later.